Uh, so you may be wondering, like, why am I playing the Ides of March in this pretty big hit from the early 70s when we were talking about sticks earlier? Well, Jim Peterick of uh, of Ides of March, the leader of the band, uh, was later produced by J.Y., James Young of Styx. Um, and they, they put out some work together. And I, I just think that's kind of the cool thing, too, about when you get into an era, you get into a town, you find out more about the music of that particular era. And I wish we were in that space still where there were regional hits and where radio stations, where everything didn't have to be, you know, based on well, it's already a big hit in San Diego kind of a thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but and there's always been some of that. But it just seems like too we've become too homogenized in our music, uh, I think, in our air checks and, and what we hear on re- radio station record lists and stuff. So I, 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 that started in Chicago, went quickly national, and was a big hit. It does remind me of a great – I don't know if the story is true, but, of course, Jim Peterick later goes on to form Survivor. Uh, and then they had that big hit with Eye of the Tiger and a bunch of other songs. But he, um, you know, when we had on JY from Sticks, he was talking about, yeah, we, you know, we played a lot of, we play any place they'd let us play. We play high, every high school hop, you know, every concert, every whatever. If, if there was money involved, we were showing up. Even though they were kind of on the rise, they still, you got to make your money somehow. So it, this is the story I heard. I wasn't there. But there was a, uh, there was a prom a couple years ahead of me uh, when I was in high school uh, and that the there was a band that was opening up for Jim Peterick and they got up and they performed they were, or they were trying to perform uh, a vehicle and uh, that was like their last song their big closing tune and they didn't know who he was they didn't know that he was in the band coming up after him. So they get up and it's like, good night. And he's like, uh, let me show you how that song is done, son. And uh, like, you know, here, hold my beer. Hold my beer. Uh, and he got up and just killed it. And I, I love stories like that. So anyway, that's what I lost too about open lines. You never know where this is going to go. Uh, and you never know where careers are going to take you to. Uh, she mentioned this guy, Lan Roberts, so I looked him up, and I was just curious. Yeah, big hit in Seattle and uh, San Francisco, L.A. He worked for a while, and also in Taipei, as one does, becomes a disc jockey in Taipei. But he was, and I think that was also pretty cool. So anyway, open lines. Where are you going to take us? Doesn't have to be about sticks. Doesn't have to be about music. Doesn't have to be about anything, except what you want to talk about next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. I've had a lot of fun on open lines tonight. Let's get restarted again with Matt in Kentucky on Coast to Coast AM, east of the Rockies. Matt, how are you? Yeah, uh, hi, Ian. At one time, you said that uh, Adam and Eve were never meant to have children. Can you explain that? I said that? Yeah. On, it's probably been a, a half a year ago. And oh, I, wow. I on that because that's what I kind of believe. I think the fall was them getting the ability to procreate. What, oh, what do you think right. of that? No, that's a, so. That's what you meant by that. Yeah. So yeah, there's all sorts of interesting theology built around Adam and Eve. Like, if Adam and Eve had just, if they hadn't touched the apple, what would have happened? You know, the 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 idea of populating the world doesn't start until you know they've been expelled from the garden. Uh, and this is so often really where the story starts is always when the creation rejects the creator. And that we don't, we'll never know what the original intent was. They could just still, if it had, if they hadn't done that, they'd still be sitting in the garden sharing pomegranates and naming new animals or something. You know what I mean? Right. We don't, we'll never know. Well, because I, because they says that uh, the the serpent said you'll be like God, and then he says no uh, knowledge of good and evil. But anyway. I, I think be like God. What is God? What did they know God as the Creator? You could be like God. You could create life. Before yeah. that, they couldn't create life because they didn't have the ability to. But the ser- 
serpent gave them the ability to have babies. What's the first thing they did after they ate? Right. They covered their they covered up their bodies. nakedness. Right. They're they're naughty bits. Yeah. Because I would see. Hey, what what have you done? You have. Did you eat? You know. Did you eat the right. fruit? I think he would have seen it. So they tried to cover it up with the leaves and stuff. But anyway, yeah, I think that's a really good point, and I, I think we could say even from that story because it ties in tomorrow night, is maybe Eve was the first falsely accused, <laughs> uh, you know, the perpetrator who was taking the blame. You know, nobody he, she didn't make Adam eat the apple, which is always an interesting. You know, why does he get to say ah, she did it? Uh, yeah. That's great. You know, there's a new movie coming out. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate you starting this off. There's a new movie out called Creator, and it's about AI. And it follows kind of, again, it, it, we talk about, there's this ongoing theme. It goes all the way back to the garden of the creation rejecting the creator. And this is the theme of Frankenstein. This is the theme of what, like iRobot. This is the theme of so, like lots of science fiction, um, and and it's a. I think it's. I'm looking forward to. It. I hope the movie's not terrible, um, but I I think that is an ongoing theme even in our understanding because one of the things we do, the first thing we do as teenagers is we start to reject our parents. So we're always having to, you know, at some point we begin to to assert our own independence, and that can take all sorts of forms. So good, I love that. Thank you. Hold me, hold my feet to the fire. West of the Rockies, Scott is in Costa Mesa on coast to coast. Scott, six talk earlier. Yeah. Well, I'm switching topics. I'm a little bit perplexed. I'm from California, and um, we, the little guys are mandated to the umph degree. We have to have our cars smog-checked and retrofitted pollutants and everything. Well, the other evening I was uh, watching yet another space launch, and it was just after sunset, and the exhaust plume was just bananas. It was enormous. Right. Right. Are, Are we taking, like, one step forward and three steps back? Because... That was a lot of pollutants going into the atmosphere with that space launch. It's a fair point. I think what we're always trying to do is, and maybe this isn't doesn't specifically just what you're saying, but I think we as a society, any society, has to decide what's worth the trade off. Yeah, e- everything's a trade off. The same argument, if you remember, you know, when people are going to the moon. We're like, well, wouldn't this money be better spent feeding people? And then you go, well, in a cost-benefit analysis, look at look at what it brings eventually. And so does that giant – that's a really interesting thought. I'd never looked at the exhaust of of a space shuttle rocket or any other rocket and went, wait, that's, where's, where's the catalytic converter on that puppy? You know, I've never, I've never thought about that. But, but you're right. Exactly. We're, it was so amazing, though, because it was awe-inspiring to watch this thing right. going so fast. It was really chill factors. Right. But then I'm like, wait a second. Now I have to pay one hundred and fifty dollars right. every years to get my car retrofitted or whatever. Right. What? But how? How messed? I mean, this is a really good question. Like some states did it differently, and they offered like a one-time upfront rebate on getting rid of your old clunkers. Remember that whole thing? And there yeah. was a that was and I, so it's so, we've always had to take sort of baby steps to determine. At least, in if not sim, if not really, then at least symbolically, what are we doing to help the environment? And there, you think about the accumulative effect over decades. A lot of our water is a lot cleaner now than it was in the 1970s, and we're and it's still like the aquifers and in farms and stuff. It's still too many pollutants out there, and it's gonna. So, what, what's our moral obligation to the future? And what are we willing to pay for the luxuries that we have today? That's all, every society ever has had to make that decision. Because I wouldn't want to live in India. I wouldn't want to live in Delhi. I wouldn't want to live under that constant smog. Well, I'm I'm all for you know doing my fair share. I just would like to know like what Elon Musk, what yeah. does his DMV fee? 
Yeah, <laughs> for the Rockets. It's yeah. very funny. And does he have to wait in line like the rest of us? That'd be very funny. I love that as an idea. Bruce's first time caller line, Wisconsin on Coast to Coast AM. It's open lines. Bruce? Yeah, and I'm telling you, you have the greatest budget tuition for this old NTS. <laughs> I think I want to drop in your classroom. I'm going to get on uh, <laughs> and, 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 and drop in. Well, you can take um, it online. That's the beauty of today. You know, Jet well, I'm met. not a line person. All right. I wanted to go back to uh, Keegan. And did you ever get any Geordies on your taste buds? Oh, funny. I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, I live. I I worked down on G Street, right down on Genesee, and so it was mostly taquerias. Right by that point, and there was really good Mexican food down there, and it was the businesses that stayed behind were terrific. Uh, how did you end up there? Now, where do you are? You in where you live now? Well, I'm out in Dover. I'm hiding out. I have my uh, Jim Morrison. Uh, can you give me sanctuary? Uh, and, uh, uh, so who did you broadcast for, WKRS or? Uh, no, they were, well, we eventually took them over. They were, WKRS was the AM signal in Lake County until uh, WEFA was the FM. And a previous caller had said, no, there was no such thing as FM for a long time. There were FMs, it's just nobody was doing anything on it. They were mostly for, like, educational purposes and stuff. And so we we were the first to take that 24 hours, and we changed the call letters to WXLC. And I think a year or two after I left uh, to finish school at University of Illinois, um, I think they bought uh KRS um that over there by the Kmart wasn't it yep yep yep, yep. and, yep. and uh, Carlson uh, Lewis Avenue right. yeah and that and near Park City where the uh where that little where the nice, huh? right where the Park City wasn't it where all the um mobile homes were or whatever well, there was a racetrack there and oh, the zebra and the owners of that property um, it was underwater, the racetrack, so they had to let it go. And they oh, probably borrowed stuff from the landfill and yeah. uh, popped it up, and there's more mobile homes on it by now. Yeah. Well, I, it, it, those are happy memories, Lake County. You know, it's it, there's so many different places all around the country that you drive through them and that you don't remember. I mean, they just don't look at all like how you remember them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it that was it was great for me when I was there, and it was fun to talk to JY and hear about how he was sort of proud of the idea. He was there was no shame in playing high schools or doing whatever. Uh, that that was you, you had to do what you had to do to make a buck, you know. And if you had to drive out to uh, to Crystal Lake to do it, but the, go to the the new place, the old barn. <laughs> Right. So if you go out there to where the money was green, you know, so be it. Well, so rectangles are rectangles, eh? Ian? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Billy's in Peoria on Coast to Coast AM. Billy? Ian, great show tonight, I got to say. Thank you. Um, so I live in Peoria, and I got into the music industry, and there's a uh, theater down here called the Madison Theater and okay. one night we, me and my buddy we're down there we work in there all the time and one night we're setting up a film projector hmm. to, we were going to show Caddyshack in the theater that night great after you know and then we did rock shows and stuff sure so we're in there we got the projector going with the big reels Everything's going good. And then I walk out front outside of the projection booth, and there's a chandelier just swinging back and forth. Oh, that goes back to the caller who was asking about, you know, like recording studios and other places that were haunted. Wow, it was, I mean, it, and I was, yeah. I was like, I called my buddy out that I was working with. I go, look at that. And, he, and then we shut the projector off and just sat there and watched it. <laughs> so it wasn't swinging because of anything. It wasn't the Caddyshack soundtrack or anything. It was just it was freeform swinging. Yes. 
Absolutely. I love that. That's cool. And then, and then, and then another thing you were talking about weird things going on in Illinois tonight. Right. So, uh, I, I went and I, I met my, uh, court appointed counselor for the first time today. <laughs> Cause and, uh, there's a story right. there. Right. That's right. You know, I got in trouble. So I had to meet the court okay. appointed counselor for the first time. And, uh, she had a lit, you know, the band lit. Yeah. Oh, right. She had a okay. lit sticker from the Madison Theater stuck up on her wall, and we wound up going out and having drinks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that story. That's wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Frank is in Colorado on Coast to Coast. It's open lines, and always good to hear these new voices. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, I just took you off the speakerphone there because I was listening to the show. Thank you. I, uh, I'm i 67 years old. I live in the mountains in a cabin, ski in, ski out cabin up here, no running water. I got, Ugh. But I got internet and stuff like that. Sounds but, cool. Uh, I used to work at a Savers, which is like a Goodwill. This was back in Albuquerque, back in the turn of the century. And uh, I I was supposed to take care of all their books, tapes, records, and CDs that came in the store. So I got to see a lot of good stuff. And I came across a book, a nonfiction book by Michael Crichton. Oh, yeah. And it was called, and he wrote very few nonfiction books. And I kept it for a while, but it didn't have a, the cover on it anymore, so it wasn't worth any money, really. Right. But it was called Electronic Life. Hmm. And he was predicting AI. Yeah, well, that's a well refining a prediction that had been around, I no doubt, for a while. But that is really cool, and I'd like to read that. Crichton was he was prophetic, yep. um, even the Andromeda strain and some of his and some of his early fiction that were all you know was kind of based on cutting edge science and things that were coming. Um, he was always. Like, that was part of what was fun about Crichton, even Jurassic Park. Yeah. You know, I mean, pulling that together. But I didn't know about this, this nonfiction. I, I didn't either, you know. And I, I didn't look through the book a whole lot because it was in really good shape. So I only read pieces of it, you know, because I didn't want to get fingerprints and all that kind of stuff on it. Uh, and I don't know <laughs> where it went, to tell you the truth right now. I don't, I don't know if I have it anymore or what. But yeah. I, had a, I had another book come through called Men of Earth. Huh. And it was written by some guy who was one of the early jet pilots oh, cool. in the military. And <laughs> it was about UFOs and contact right. with jet pilots. Right. It was all stuff that he wasn't supposed to write but right. he wrote after he was out of the military. Did he write it using an assumed name? Uh, that's why I can't remember. It was such a small book and... It was, right. it was fascinating. I mean, it was like a 1950s jet pilot, and he had right. really serious close encounters. Every every pilot I talked to from that period, the, all of this activity around uh, UAPs and all that, they're like, "Yep, that was just you know that was just part of our." We you never knew who was going to have the story, but the next time the pilots got together for a Christmas party or something like that, yep. you said you would hear things that, and, and then it would be your turn, and then you'd see something, and next time you'd be the pass, passing that along. You know, I was born and raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and my father was one of the greatest generation, and my father-in-law. Right. And the stories those guys have to tell. Well, my dad's a World War II because he was triple decorated. Yeah. But, uh, my father-in-law, uh, you know, he worked. Uh, high-level research in the government for explosives and stuff. It's just the stories these guys all have to tell. But the main thing I, I yeah. want to tell you about that Michael Crichton thing. Oh, uh, and that, I'm glad you did, but I'm also told you. I'm also glad you told me about your ski and ski out shack. I think that sounds really cool because I have a sister-in-law that lives in uh, Evergreen. It was just filled with bears and everything's attacking each other and. Uh, it's, it's great to be around wild country like that. All right, open lines. Give you the numbers, and I'll give you a little sample of AI I've been working on. On Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Puttet. You know, so a couple of people have brought up AI, and I thought I'd share something with you if you if you have a minute. Absolutely. 
So there's a lot of conversation on college campuses about AI and the idea of using like uh, a chat a GPT to create your papers for you. And there are a lot of students who've actually looked me in the eye when I've said, when I've challenged them who's in the paper and they go, Oh no, but yeah, but that came, that came from chat GPT. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, okay. They well, told you. Yeah. And I'd be like, I'm, that's your outside voice. Do not, that's not the thing you tell me. I said, you're supposed to be doing original work. Right. This is for about original thought. And they're like, yeah, I was busy. I had work and uh, I and I wanted to, um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I got it right. So I went to chat GPT <sighs> and I said, well, that doesn't that won't necessarily make it right. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? And so this whole AI conversation, you've seen this new movie coming out called The uh, Creator. Yes. Right. And so it's about like we we should never have created AI. I don't know what the boundaries are yet, but I had some fun with it on the air and I thought I'd share it with you. So uh, Ed Weigel is my regular go to voice when I'm producing the football vaudeville. games for. Oh. Yeah. Or for. Yeah. And for vaudeville for the yeah, fight. And, I yeah, remember that was Ed Weigel. And now Fred Winston is a legendary uh, Chicago radio personality. They're both friends. And uh, I wanted to do an illustration to the students on the difference between what is original and not original. So that to try to remind them that they they can't when if the if the syllabus is calling for them to do original work, they can't do AI. So pardon me because it'll say the call letters of my college station, Wildcat 919, okay. but, but here you go. Roll it. Online and on campus, some people insist that AI content is identical to human-generated communication. Uh, let's workshop this. Hello, I'm Ed Weigel, the voice of Wildcat 919. And I'm Fred Weigel, the AI version of Ed Weigel. We sound exactly the same. Uh, no, we don't. I, for one, cannot detect a difference. <laughs> Which is exactly the point. Students may think AI-generated homework sounds like a good idea. But if your assignment calls for original thought and original writing, AI doesn't count. Even though nobody can tell the difference between us. Let's go over this again. I'm Ed Weigel, the voice of Wildcat 91.9. And I'm Fred Weigel, the AI version of Ed Weigel. Wow, the similarities between us are uncanny. Oh, why don't you AI generate yourself a mattress and give it a rest? Hey, never thought of that, Ed. Yeah, because you're AI. You're not capable of original thought. I'm Fred Weigel, the AI version of Ed Weigel. Remember, if your assignment calls for original thought and original writing, AI doesn't count. Or to put it in a completely different way, AI doesn't count if your assignment calls for original thought or writing. Gotcha. I win. Those are my exact words, except in a different order. And you say I'm not original. Uh, an important reminder from Wildcat 919. Or Wild 91 Cat 9. Same thing. Yeah, no. AI generated work on a college campus has a place, but many professors already prohibit its use. So check your syllabus. A message in the public interest from Wild 91 Cat 1. Oh, now he's got me doing it. Gotcha. I win. There you go. That's so, great. <laughs> the, sta the current status of AI. You know, I don't know if you know, uh, they gave us a memo not too long ago. Uh, we at the network are not to use that. Oh. Not to log on at all until we get more from the uppers. Yeah. Good. Glad to hear that. But I find it interesting that you have to tell your students that. Yeah, uh, and and everybody it ha again, like if you're if you're running a small company and you need to write a pamphlet and you're not a great writer and it's going to be between you and your you know business associates, have at it. But if you're if you're pretending that it's real, that it's something that you came up with, the no, fact that you wrong. logged in the data is not creative or not at all. <laughs> oh, right. All right. I'm glad you enjoyed that. All right, let's get back. We'll wrap up open lines next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. 
Well, coming up tomorrow night on Coast to Coast, don't miss this new book about junk science. Kind of parallels a little bit about the AI thing in the sense that what has become accepted by, you know, some areas of jurisprudence shouldn't even be called science, um, says one author. And uh, and he's the guy who's been leading the national campaign against getting it out of our courts and getting the people who were victims of it out of our jails. Let's go to, let's see, Sergey is in Montreal on Coast to Coast AM. Sergey? Oh, Serge. Serge. Oui. Yes, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to you, uh, I think it was in 2007, about uh, the Emperor Constantine. Uh, oh. During a commercial, yeah. I told you that, uh, well, you told me, oh, he was the first Christian emperor. I said to you, that's what he said, and then uh, other things. Anyway, I saw a documentary about him, mm -hmm. and I, I knew that there was something wrong because they were— uh, he had uh, so many uh, writers uh, of the uh, what happened uh, with the, the the apostles and uh, Jesus. Uh, so he, he said, "Well, I I can uh, multiply the writings because I have some script, uh, scriptures, uh, some people that will uh, uh, write uh, the same things, uh, and uh, I will give them to you." So anyway, he. Uh, he did, he did that, but uh, he chose those who, who uh, um, the writings didn't come for, uh, didn't uh, appeal to him. He would say, uh, go this way, and, and others, he would say, go the, the other way. Oh, sure. And those who went somewhere, uh, they were eliminated, uh, and their scriptures weren't uh, published. Oh, no, there's no doubt about it. Um, in fact, uh, he's known for you know, sort of large-scale executions of people that didn't do what he wanted them to do, which he he wanted Christianity to be a unifying religion, and he wanted it. He, he was not yet baptized. He wasn't baptized until he was on his uh, deathbed. Um, but that, yeah, that, so he, he is responsible for— um, on the, on the downside, he's responsible for a lot of people hiding— documents some of which would take centuries to find yeah well uh, it's a good thing that everybody that uh, works uh, um, apostles or, or uh, followers they have all the same writings like uh, do unto others like you wish others sure. to do unto you and love thy neighbor like yourself they, right that, he couldn't he couldn't stop them well and i don't think he wanted to stop that what he wanted was he wanted he wanted sort of a national religion um because they had lo the the i the 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 roman empire had become so fractionalized uh with local tribal gods and you know city gods and so he was hoping to to do that he he was un unable to do that even at the tip of a spear um but he was so he was you know a pagan i guess you would say um, oh, yeah. And only at the very end of his life did he uh, begin to, uh, as a catech, you know, cumin. But he, he was, but he did favor Christianity. He did open the door for uh, later popes uh, to pick up where he dropped off. But appreciate you jumping in, getting a starter for this last segment here on Coast to Coast. Dempsey is in New York on Coast to Coast. Dempsey? Hello. Hey. Uh-oh, hey, you your pizza's ready. for you. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. I was just waiting for your uh, your delivery or whatever the noise I'm hearing in the background. Dempsey? Okay. I'm going to put you on hold for a second, see if we can't sort that out. Patricia, first-time caller line in Detroit, Rock City, on Coast to Coast AM. Patricia? What happened to Patricia Bragg? Tell me about that. Well, I went to a lecture with her and her father, Paul Bragg, in 1975 in Toronto. And I heard her on your program years ago. I just Would have had to have been, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she was a health writer? 
Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, she died uh, last, it says here, she died last month. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, it's funny, I remember her dad more than I remember her. Because um, he was he was kind of a pioneer, right? And then she did great work. I'm not taking anything away from that, but he was sort of the. He, I would he wasn't even like occasionally pop up like Mike Douglas or something. I mean, he was around. He was he was a well known oh, name in that. Oh yeah, sure. He did a lot of work on fasting. He wrote right. several little pamphlets. And that's I mean, how the, I got to go to their, their show, in fact. They let me sell the pamphlets so I could afford to see their show. Yeah, and I uh, really enjoyed it. I'm I'm actually in the middle of a, a fast right now. I'm in a medical fast right now. So, oh, my and goodness. I, yeah, I do it. I try to do it about every about every 12 weeks. Um, not easy. <laughs> I don't mind telling you that. Uh, but, uh, yep. Just trying to do a detox uh, that helps oh, a lot. Well. Yeah, that is good. I've done it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank well, you, Patricia. Sure, appreciate much. that. Tom takes us closer to the end of the show for open lines. Tom is in Charlotte on Coast to Coast. Tom. Hey, I just hey. wanted to point out that the uh, exhaust from most rockets is actually water. Is it vapor? Yeah, well, oxygen and hydrogen, those are the two sure. primary uh, elements that are used for uh, launching rockets. So, Okay. The, I accept the problem, that. The problem is that everybody's bragging about the carbon dioxide, but the water vapor is like multiple times as far as greenhouse gases uh, effective in retaining heat in the atmosphere. Oh, interesting. So, Hadn't heard that. We we talk a little bit about the atmosphere from time to time, so I'll file that away for a future conversation when we've got an, an expert on. But, I, you know, he was kind of joking when he was talking about, you know, here he is having to go to the DMV, get his catalytic converter permit or whatever it is, and, and there's that rocket. But, yeah, fair enough. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, let me go to uh, Dick, who's in Nebraska, east of the Rockies on Coast to Coast. Dick? Yes, sir, Ian. Good to hear you. Uh, you yes, too. I'm in uh, Fairbury, Nebraska, about 90 miles north of you. Okay. And uh, uh, I uh, recall a program you had uh, quite a few years ago that you were talking something about uh, pencil leads and sticking that in our yeah. skin or something? Well, I have, I had, to this day, it was, it was actually an open line call. It was just kind of funny. I have a piece of pencil lead stuck underneath my, uh, under the skin of my thumb after I got into a sword fight with uh, Jamie Herwith in seventh grade. And he, he thrust at me his very sharpened pencil, and the lead broke off in my finger, and it's still there. It's this little, it's this little dot on my finger. Oh, yes. Uh, 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 both my wife and I are graduates of Kansas State uh, <laughs> and also Arizona State. How about that? We parallel that. Uh, and uh, how? But why would you remember the whole thing about the pencil lead? Well, I don't know. We were listening to you. I don't know how many years ago that was, but we got quite a quite a chuckle out of it. Yeah. And, I'll take you uh, know we had had some of the same experience with pencil lead we got it stuck in our thumb or something <laughs> and it's still there i mean it's like it won't grow out uh, wherever it usually like you know your skin moves around as you get older or recedes or whatever and it's not it's just, it looks like it looks like a tattoo it looks like i'm in some sort of obscure thumb gang or something and that's my that's my tattoo symbol from having killed a guy with my thumb um I may take a photo of that and put it on Twitter so that people see what we're oh, talking that'd, about. That'd be great. Thank you, Dick. Appreciate that. Levi is in uh, Missouri, and I think that'll do it. Go ahead, Levi. Uh, it's great to be on the show. Thank you for having us. Hey, it's, it's funny. I also have a, a single dot graphite tattoo on my <laughs> really? uh, palm of my hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, we should um, do a whole but... show of people only who have had have graphite on their underneath their skin. 
Uh, but I was calling. I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, an alien encounter that I had. Oh, yeah. So this was in uh, 2013, um, about 30 miles north of Austin, Texas. And um, I was living with my uh, uh, aunt and uncle at the time in a, a pull-behind trailer. They, they had a house, but I was living out there. And um, it was a little dark, and, you know, there was uh, wildlife that would walk up on me sometimes, but I, I knew the difference between, yeah. uh, you know, deer and coyotes and stuff. Sure. Um, but uh, I was sitting in the trailer, and I see this red glow uh, by the window, and I think it's brake lights. So I go out to investigate, and hmm. um, there's no, no cars moving or anything. So I go around the back of the trailer, and I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette. And uh, looking at my phone, well, then my phone dies, and then I hear something walking. I can hear, you know, footsteps. And I look up, and I can't see very well because it's dark, so I I pull out my, uh, uh, you know, little Bic lighter. Got about 30 seconds here, man. Go ahead. All right. And I can see uh, it's about seven and a half feet tall. It's, like, light gray, and it's got wet skin. and I, it scared the hell out of me, man. I, yeah, I it scares me to just hear you telling the story. Yeah, well, we'll have to uh, that have to be that for now. But that's a that's cool, uh, and that's one of the things that's so much fun about Coast to Coast. Um, you know, other shows t- tend to weed out callers like that, but we don't. Uh, tomorrow night, Junk Science main guest. Plus, first hour we'll revisit the JFK thing too. Coming up. In the meantime, Deus Te Amat. And I do, too.